It is midnight in Washington, 5 a.m. in London, and 2 on a Monday afternoon here in Seoul. I'm Moon Gwanyang. Let's get a check of the main stories we're following at this hour. Mid-February it is, that is, when South Korea has proposed holding reunions for families separated by the Korean War as it welcomed the North's recent proposal to stage the inter-Korean meetings. Korea imposes another 12-hour lockdown effective as of 6 a.m. this morning on poultry farms in three provinces to curb a spreading bird flu outbreak, banning the movement of animals, people and vehicles. And Korean shares in the local currency dropped to a month-long lows as signs of slowing growth in China and a plunge in emerging market assets stoke concerns that global funds may pull money out of the region. Now we'll have those stories and more, but first let us begin this Monday afternoon with the latest development in what many or what may be seen as a thaw in relations between the two Koreas. Amid a more amicable atmosphere, South Korea has proposed dates for resuming long-suspended reunions for families separated since the Korean War. While that seems all well and good, North Korea's reaction to upcoming joint military drills between Seoul and Washington could throw a spanner in the works. Arirang News Unification Ministry correspondent Hwang Sang-hee starts us off. Families separated since the Korean War will have the chance to see each other again in mid-February if North Korea agrees to the South's offer. Seoul's Unification Ministry said it made the proposal through the inter-Korean hotline on Monday morning. Considering the wishes of the separated families, we proposed holding a round of family reunions at Mount Gumgang from February 17th to the 22nd for six days. The ministry also offered to hold working-level talks on Wednesday at the North Korean side of the truce village of Panmunjom to fine-tune the details of the event. The North took many by surprise with its sudden proposal last Friday that the reunions resume at a convenient time for South Korea after the Lunar New Year holiday, which falls at the end of this week. If the event takes place next month, 100 divided family members from each side will be reunited. Millions of Koreans were separated from their loved ones when the country was divided more than six decades ago. Around 72,000 South Koreans are on the waiting list for a chance to meet their families one last time, although time is running out for the very elderly relatives. Despite the friendlier tone in recent weeks, preparations for the event may run into some problems due to the upcoming joint military drills between South Korea and the United States. The South Korean government has made clear the drills will take place as scheduled, starting at the end of February, despite North Korea's repeated calls to cancel what it views as war games. This year's training, however, will not involve U.S. aircraft carriers or strategic bombers. Seoul is expected to notify its neighbors, including Pyongyang, of the schedule and purpose of the exercises after the Lunar New Year holiday. Hwang sang Arirang News. Meanwhile, a U.S. envoy in North Korea has called on Pyongyang to take more meaningful steps towards peaceful reconciliation. Talking to reporters in Beijing Sunday, U.S. Special Representative for North Korea Policy, Glenn Davies, said that the most important task for Pyongyang is to go beyond its recent charm offensive, which includes a proposal for reunions for families separated since the Korean War. Now, Davies said he cannot pinpoint the reasons for the North's recent actions, but said this is not the first time Pyongyang has shown interest in reconciliation. Davies will meet with his Chinese counterpart Wu Dawei and other high-ranking officials in Beijing until Tuesday before heading to Seoul and then to Tokyo. Moving now to the bird flu crisis affecting the southern and central regions of this country. The government has ordered a new temporary standstill on the movement of poultry, livestock and farm workers. Now, this is a second movement ban since the virus broke out more than 10 days ago. Kwon Soa reports. It was a busy weekend for disease prevention authorities as areas with confirmed or suspected bird flu cases are being supervised around the clock. Despite their best efforts, the rising number of confirmed cases prompted the government on Sunday to issue a 12-hour standstill from Monday morning on the movement of any livestock, farm workers and vehicles in Gyeonggi-do, Chungcheong-nam-do and Chungcheong-bukdo province, which includes the administrative city of Sejong and Daejeon. 
The standstill came into effect at 6 a.m. on Monday and will be lifted at 6 p.m. The government took the step as fears grow the virus could spread throughout the entire nation, especially after the highly pathogenic H5N8 strain was confirmed in more ducks over the weekend, including on a farm in Korea's southern Jeollanamdo province. Further north in Buya, Chungcheongnamdo province, the virus has been confirmed in chickens for the first time. This is especially concerning as chickens are more vulnerable to the virus and they greatly outnumber the number of ducks. The highly pathogenic bird flu virus spreads at a very fast speed among chickens. That's why we decided to cull more of them as a preventive measure. With that in mind, authorities have decided to cull all ducks and chickens within a three-kilometer radius of six regions along the west coast. Nearly half a million birds have been culled so far, with another 2.2 million expected to be slaughtered over the coming days. The virus has also been found in migratory bird droppings at Xihuaho Lake in Hwasong, Gyeonggi-do province. This is the most northern point in which the virus has been detected, increasing worries it could spread to the Seoul metropolitan area. More cases are predicted to show up this week, especially since the virus has an incubation period of 7 to 21 days. Prime Minister Jung Hong won has ordered a state of emergency and has called for special attention ahead of the Lunar New Year holiday, which begins on Thursday. Kwon so Arirang News. As the dust settles on one of the largest ever personal and financial data leaks in Korea's history, the country's main political parties have been rolling out their own measures to investigate the matter, and the National Assembly will revise a related law to bring the crisis under control. Our Kim Young gil has more. In the wake of the massive data leak, Korea's National Assembly plans to pass a revision to the Personal Information Protection Act at next month's extraordinary session. The revision will form a legal framework to make mobile spam messages illegal and clamp down on voice phishing, both of which are the most common forms of financial fraud. Financial firms will also be restricted from sharing their clients' personal information with their affiliates to prevent secondary damages. The leader of the main opposition Democratic Party, Kim ang has proposed the National Assembly form a special committee to find out how the data breaches were able to happen. Kim is also demanding government and presidential office officials step down to take responsibility for the leaks. There should be a full-scale personnel shakeup at the presidential office of Cheong Wade and the cabinet, as these leaks were brought on by President Park Geun-hye's uncommunicative politics. He also urged the ruling Senori party to accept his party's proposal of setting up a special committee to oversee a parliamentary probe into the matter. Kim said the government must determine the causes of the leaks and come up with preventive measures. However, the Senori party says it's opposed to Kim's proposal, as the matter can be handled by one of the National Assembly's standing committees. A separate parliamentary probe by a special committee is unnecessary. Our top priority is to bring the situation under control. President Park has promised to hold people accountable. At an emergency meeting with related ministers on Sunday, Prime Minister Chung Hong won ordered the establishment of a government-wide task force and to devise follow-up measures to bring the crisis under control. Kim Young-gye. Arirang News. Now, President Park has weighed in on the issue as well, making it clear her administration would hold those involved in the massive data leak responsible by launching a thorough investigation into all financial companies in the nation, including the three credit card firms in question. Meeting with her top secretaries Monday, the president described the leak as, quote, something that should never have happened and ordered her officials to devise fundamental measures to make sure customers do not suffer when financial firms collect and store personal data.
Now, she also called on financial firms to find other ways to identify individuals by benchmarking other countries rather than relying solely on resident registration numbers, which are widely used here in Korea. All of the day's important events, events close to home, around the world. The arts and culture scene and the heart of global business. Arirang News has your whole day covered. The legislature will convene a plenary session this Wednesday and vote on the government. Korea has become even more dependent on China as an export destination. The Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy says exports to China accounted for 26 percent of Korea's export total of 500 billion U.S. dollars last year, which is the highest rate ever recorded. Now, mobile phone parts, semiconductors, auto parts and automobiles made up the bulk of exports to China, resulting in a trade surplus of $60.6 billion, which is higher than Korea's export surplus of $44.2 billion. Experts say Korea should take a more aggressive approach in dealing with the ever-growing Chinese market, adding it may need to reduce its dependence on China in the future, given its slowing economic growth. And that is proving to be true as the sell-off in global markets turned to Asia with stocks across the region plunging and trading on Monday as worries grow over slowing growth in China and signs the U.S. will ease back on stimulus. The declines first hit developing economies with currencies in Argentina, Turkey and Ukraine falling especially rapidly, played also by political problems at home. But the sell-off has since spread to more advanced economies with the U.S. tumbling Friday and shares in Seoul slumping to a five-month low in early trading on this Monday. As of 1.30 p.m. Korea time, the benchmark Cosby was down 1.5 percent at 19.12 after touching an intraday low of 1899.8, which is its lowest level since August last year. The Korean won also dropped to a four-month low for the sixth day of losses, the longest run of losses since March, falling 0.4 percent to 1,083 won per dollar flat. Meanwhile, Korean tech giants Samsung Electronics and Google have agreed on a global patent cross-licensing agreement. The new agreement will allow the two tech giants to share currently owned patents as well as any filed in the next 10 years. Our UDN reports. Samsung Electronics and Google, which are frequently involved in patent infringement lawsuits but not against each other, have agreed to share their existing patents and those filed over the next 10 years. Without providing details, the two companies emphasized the deal will help them better avoid litigation. The head of Samsung's Intellectual Property Center, An Seung Ho, said in a press release that Samsung and Google are showing the rest of the industry that there is more to gain from cooperating than engaging in unnecessary patent disputes. The sentiment was echoed by Google's Deputy General Counsel for Patents, Alan Lowe, who said through agreements like this, companies can reduce the potential for litigation and focus instead on innovation. The comments appear to have been a direct shot at Apple, with which the two companies have been engaged in a number of multinational patent battles. Samsung is the second largest patent holder in the United States, and Google is the 11th, and the deal is expected to give both an edge in upcoming patent battles. For Google, pundits say the deal has broad implications, considering its growing reach into hardware and wearables. With Samsung's hardware patents, Google can more easily expand into the wearable industry. Samsung, which seemed like it was trying to break away from Google's Android platform to develop a mobile platform of its own, will continue to work with Google in that realm. Looking ahead, the deal is also expected to lead to deeper collaboration on research and development of future projects. Yurian, Arirang News. And across the globe, uh, there is a glint of hope in otherwise tough talks in Geneva between the Syrian government and the Western-backed opposition. In the first deal struck from the latest round of talks, women and children will be allowed to leave the besieged city of homes. Connie Kim has the details. The Syrian government and the opposition Syrian National Coalition struck their first yet small agreement on the second day of their international peace talks in Geneva. Under the deal, women and children will be allowed to leave the besieged city of homes. 
hopefully, starting tomorrow, women and children will be able to leave central, uh, central uh, the old city in, uh, in Homs. Homs is a key battleground in the conflict with government forces pinning down rebels and civilians with heavy mortar attacks for more than one year. The two sides failed to reach common ground on sending humanitarian aid into homes on Saturday, but UN envoy Lakhdar Brahimi, who is acting as mediator between two sides, has admitted progress was always going to be slow. The core objective of the talks come on Monday as the two sides will begin to discuss political matters and specifically the establishment of a transitional government. Any transitional government would require President Bashar al-Assad to cede power, a condition the Syrian government refuses to accept. Syria's deputy foreign minister forced the government's position home on Sunday, saying Assad will remain in his post and continue to win elections. The opposition says the regime is stalling and said Monday's talks with Brahimi will show whether the government is willing to negotiate. Tomorrow, we'll start talking about transition uh, from dictatorship to democracy. Clearly, the regime is not enthusiastic to talk about that, uh, and they are stalling. The Geneva meeting marks the first time in almost three years that the Syrian government and the main opposition group have held face-to-face -face talks aimed at ending the bitter civil war. It's estimated that more than 130,000 people have been killed in Syria since parts of the country rose up against President Assad in March 2011. Connie Kim, Arirang News. And uh, there seems to be no settling in the Thai capital of Bangkok. A Thai anti-government protest leader has been shot dead in Bangkok as violence erupted once again on Sunday in demonstrations aimed at blocking early voting ahead of next week's disputed general elections. Son Jung-in has the details. Thousands of Thais were unable to cast their ballots on Sunday as anti-government demonstrators surrounded polling stations in Bangkok and southern parts of the country, obstructing early voting ahead of next week's general elections. An anti-government protest leader was killed as clashes erupted between protesters and government supporters. Police say Sutin Taratin was speaking on top of a truck when he was shot dead by an unidentified assailant. This brings the death toll to 10, with scores wounded since anti-government protests flared up in November. Protesters want Prime Minister Inglak Sinawat to resign, accusing her of being a puppet for her brother and exile former leader Taksin Sinawat. They want an unelected People's Council that will oversee political reform. Last week, Thailand declared a state of emergency, raising doubts whether general elections could be held according to schedule. A Thai court ruled last Friday that the general vote scheduled for February 2nd could be postponed out of fear of violence and disruptions. This latest violence came despite pledges from protest leaders not to obstruct the advanced elections. Early voting has been cancelled in at least 45 out of 50 polling stations in Bangkok, while voting was also disrupted at several venues in southern provinces. Some 49 million Thais are eligible to cast their votes, with over 2 million having registered for advanced voting. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. And now it is time for our first arts and culture segment of the week with our Lee Tae-ho. And today, Tae-ho brings us news of a project that is finally complete, a historic project, I may add, after three long years. Good afternoon to you, Tae-ho. Good afternoon. So uh, what is this historical project we're talking about? Well, the aim of the project was to uh, restore a historical treasure, not just a national treasure, but a historical treasure. And considering the age of the document that was being restored, which is hundreds of years old, Three years was a rather short time span to get the whole project completed. It is the oldest existing book printed with movable metal type, a fact UNESCO confirmed in 2001. The book is the Chikji, a collection of sun teachings by the most influential Buddhist monks of the time, compiled by the Buddhist monk Pegun. The second volume of the Chikji was printed in 1377 during the reign of King Wu of the Koryo dynasty. And now the restoration of that second volume, including the final page, which was considered lost, is complete. 
The restoration was done using traditional processes, and the hope is that the information gained will be of great help in restoring the first volume as well. Restoring the book using movable metal type gave us a good look at how type and print were made at the time, as well as how typesetting was done. The person responsible for restoring individual metal plates was Im In Ho, a movable metal type artisan who used beeswax casting method to recreate the original plates. The beeswax casting method was used because it uses red clay and sand, which are the easiest natural ingredients to use today. The traditional methods that were used to restore the second volume of Chikji are sure to be of great assistance when restoring the first volume, which is currently only available on woodblocks and in digital form. You know, uh, keeping with the old way of, of, of restoring this historical treasure, it seems to be um, the best way to refurbish a piece of history, but at the same time, um, very difficult, right? That's right. It's very tedious because each of the different characters must be made into metal using this uh, very classic and very traditional method of uh, making these little uh, metal characters. But I think what they learn from this whole process is uh, really a sneak peek into how it was done in the past and it's something that will be very useful when they uh, restore the first volume as well. All right, we look forward to that and from a historically invaluable text to a classic one, you have more news for us. That's right. Now, uh, with Lunar New Year just a few short days away, it'll soon be the year of the blue horse. But with all the different productions of Mary Shelley's classic Frankenstein opening here in Korea, it might as well may as well be called Year the Frankenstein instead. Let's take a look. Written in 1910 by author Mary Shelley, the classic novel Frankenstein has been remade into countless adaptations and productions. And now, 104 years later in Korea of all places, 2014 is set to be the Year of Frankenstein. First up, we will soon be seeing Frankenstein on the silver screen with the release of director Stuart Beatty's I, Frankenstein, opening in theaters nationwide on February 6. The film stars Aaron Eckhart and Bill Nye and revolves around the story of Frankenstein, who is caught smack dab in the middle of a centuries-old war between two immortal clans. And in March, Chungmo Art Hall is set to commemorate its 10-year anniversary with a production of the musical Frankenstein an original Korean production that has called to arms the best of the best in the business, from producers all the way down to the cast. I was brought to tears just reading the script. Newfound energy came bursting out. And I feel like this is a production where I can try new things. This is about very extraordinary people, but rather than feeling extraordinary, it makes a person take another look at themselves. And I think Frankenstein is one of those characters that an actor can put a lot of emotion into. And in the fall, the 2011 hit production of Frankenstein will hit Korean stages as well. The worldwide success that was directed by English filmmaker Danny Boyle and starred Benedict Cumberbatch will now be taken on by acclaimed Korean director Cho Wang Hua and set designer Chung Sung Ho, elevating the anticipation for the production up another notch. So, Teo, like you said, it will be the year of the Frankenstein because uh, apparently it looks like there will be several <laughs> variations of this piece here in Korea. That's right. Now, uh, and I think what a lot of people don't know about the Frankenstein classic is that uh, Frankenstein was not actually a zombie because he was technically, technically considered alive, as well as the name Frankenstein as well, because uh, Frankenstein was actually the name of the doctor in the novel who created Frankenstein the monster. So there's a lot of different widely accepted uh, kind of... Uh, difficulties that people accept as the normal here. Right. Normally, I would have thought the name of the monster was uh, Frankenstein. So what is the name of the monster? Uh, in, the, in the classic, uh, Mary Shelley only calls it by it, creature, or monster. It, was never, it never had a real name to it. Hmm, very interesting. <laughs> All right. Uh, we will be looking forward to those very, uh, several variations of those classic, and uh, we will see you tomorrow with uh, more. All right. And here now is a look at the weather conditions in your neck of the woods.
Well, that's all for me at this hour. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I'll be back with more of the day's latest at 4 p.m. Korea time. See you then.